when someone is a preacher and they have to be at a certain pulpit, there are people who think they can take advantage of that and they can do various wicked things knowing that the preacher in a in a sense is limited in time and space and cannot monitor what they're doing and so while the cat's away the mice will play and this happened one one day in 1978 i was at temple around kodesh and i was at the pulpit and being at the pulpit i was very limited in time and space I could only see what was in the room there, the congregation, the audience, the pulpit, and uh, the various uh, furnishings of Temple Aron Kodesh, the Aron Kodesh, etc. And so I was very limited, but the Holy Spirit was not limited. And before I started to preach, all of a sudden I went into spirit and I was monitoring someone who was about 15 miles away, and I was seeing everything they were doing. And as soon as the service was over, I got in the car and I drove to where this was, and I went in and I checked to see if what I had seen was actually true. And it was, it was verified. Uh, they left uh, plenty of evidence. And so I was not fooled. And let me tell you something, we cannot fool God. If you think that there's something that you can pull down the blind and God is not looking and you can get away with it, you are very much mistaken. And this is what Gehazi, uh, who apparently believed in a, a prosperity gospel, he said, you know, wait a minute, this guy came here with a lot of money. And uh, aren't we supposed to have money? I mean, we're in the ministry, right? And uh, doesn't God uh, sort of take care of his uh, own? And uh, shouldn't we have health and wealth and uh, everything coming up roses all the time financially? Uh, our stock going up on, in the stock market, big homes, big fancy cars. And uh, everything should be uh, like that, right? So when this Gehazi saw, and he was lusting, be, be careful of your lust, my friend. Sometimes we're proud and we lust to get attention, or we lust to be in the center of things, or we lust to be the, the leader, or we have other uh, lusts. This guy had a lust, and his lust said, wait a minute, you, you, you must be crazy. Uh, Elisha to let this guy go. Here he comes with a big offering. He's got all this gold and all this, and you're you're just letting him go. So uh, Gehazi tells Naaman, thinking that Elisha's back was turned, uh, that Elisha was stuck at the pulpit and couldn't see what was going on uh, many miles away, and. Uh, uh, and he says, he says a lie, first of all. He operates in falsehood. He says that Elisha has changed his mind. Yeah, it's true. He was living a sacrificial lifestyle. He was not putting a burden on anyone. He didn't want unbelievers to think that it's all about money. And he didn't want this guy to feel like he had purchased his healing. This uh, Aramean uh, military guy. Uh, so basically, uh, he refused the gift. Naaman attempts to give gifts to Elisha, but Elisha's, Elisha refuses them. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. And Naaman vows that he will worship the Lord from now on. And there's no talk about money. And this is what Elisha wants. And he's trying to mentor his apprentice, Gehazi. But there's a curse that's involved here. The curse of leprosy. 
And this curse has been taken away. I want to tell you something. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And it can be a curse. Just like people who win the lottery find that it is a curse and not a blessing. Very often this has happened. And I want to tell you something. If you are lusting like a hazi over lottery tickets, you better watch out. Uh, Elisha's servant Gehazi, he determines to get that gift. He wants the money. He's lusting after it. And uh, and so he goes and uh, he says a lie. My, my, my master has changed his mind and would like those gifts, please. And then Gehazi hides the gifts and returns to uh, his master, Elisha, uh, hiding the gifts as if he could hide from God, as if he could hide from the man of God. And Gehazi's leprosy is such that the leprosy that was on the Arame Aramean uh, army guy jumps on him and Elisha tells Gehazi that he knows what has happened he was with him just like Rav Shaul says when you discipline that man in the Corinthian Kehila, I will be with you in the spirit I'm not there uh, in the body but I am in the spirit and what does he do? He curses Gehazi and his family with leprosy right then and there. You see, we're not, it's not a, a health and wealth uh, prosperity gospel. It's a curse gospel about someone who took the curse, about the curse that goes down to the third and fourth generation. It's not just Gehazi, but it's his family. It's his family that have to deal with his sin. And that, that generational curse is right there in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. Whether you want to see it or not, it is there. And the gospel is all about removing a curse. It's not about filling your pockets with money. Your money perish with you. Uh, uh, you, you, you. You see all these guys uh, who are pursuing filthy lucre like Gehazi, and they don't want to really preach this message. It doesn't fit. You won't find uh, six-figure guys down in Houston, Texas, Texas, uh, preaching Second Kings chapter 5, verses 20 to 27. That will never get preached. That verse will lie dormant in their Bible and never get underlined, highlighted, and it will not become a topic of a sermon. But you've got to go back here and look at this whole story again. It starts out with this curse, this disease. Naaman is a highly successful commander of the Aramean army, but he's got a big problem. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. And because of this problem, there's going to be great light. Those who sit in darkness have seen a great light. The light is going to shine uh, even uh, in the palace of the Aramean king. And uh, notice the the man Naaman, a little girl, his uh, wife's maid, a young uh, Israelite captive. She's actually a little slave girl. She tells her mistress about Elisha's ability that he has. Now, of course, this is really not his ability. This is the ability of the Ruach HaKodesh. The Ruach HaKodesh has the ability to be more than uh, to be at more than one place at one time and to help someone be seized by the hair of the head and in visions of god see something like uh, ezekiel did uh, when he's not there physically 
but he's there spiritually to monitor even the comings and goings of the Ruach HaKodesh in the Beis HaMikdash in Jerusalem and all of this during the time of the Golas of the Babylonian exile. And uh, this is uh, not El Elisha's ability. This is God's ability that was given to the prophet. And the prophet, the Navi of God, operates in uh, a, a spiritual dimension of healing and word of knowledge, word of wisdom, etc. All those gifts that you see in the uh, book of Acts, etc. Uh, and, 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 and this little girl, being an Israelite, had heard of the reputation of Elisha, but it was really the reputation of the Ruach HaKodesh because it is God who does these things. If anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. And so there's a large gift that's now getting in the picture. Believing the young girl, Naaman, travels to meet Elisha, carrying with him considerable amounts of gold and silver, and oh boy, there must have been a little label on those coins saying, beware of the curse. Beware of the curse. If you're uh, thinking about money all the time and your heart is in your check checking account and your savings account and you're thinking about uh, tearing down barns and building bigger barns and uh, you're going into your uh, old age, thinking about money, 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 money. You better take heed because there's a little, uh, there's a little warning there, like a warning on a package of cigarettes. Warning, <laughs> filthy lucre brings a curse. So the next thing that we read is in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, where there is a request by the king, the uh, Aramean king. Uh, he has a letter uh, to the king of Israel, and he's requesting th that Naaman be healed. <laughs> Don't ever... Don't ever ask for anything of a spiritual nature uh, when you're dealing with a, a carnal person who doesn't have a clue. And what was the response of this king, the king of Israel? He tears his clothes in frustration. He, 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 he says, uh-uh, uh, this, they want to have war, and this is the pretext. This request is just a, 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 a smokescreen excuse for the Arameans to attack Israel. Because what? You didn't grant my request? Well, then we're going to war with you. And, of course, that wasn't the case at all. But the, uh, the, the kings tend to think about keeping their throne at all costs, uh, war or no war. And so their mind is always on war. And right now, Vladimir Putin is thinking very much like this. Everything is a matter of war. It's war, war, war. Just like Gehazi, it's money, money, money. These people have tunnel vision. They are not, they are not spiritual. They don't have a clue what's really going on. What's really going on is God wants his lost sheep found. He wants his name to be famous so that everyone can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And he's getting ready to do something to shine a big light on the people of the Aramean nation. And, of course, he does it with signs and wonders. So then the next thing that happens in chapter 5, verse 8, is you have the reassurance by the man of God. You have Elisha telling the king of Israel, 
No, no, no. Just just send him over. No problem. And Naaman is going to learn that this is the true prophetic source. Don't talk to me about Islam. Don't talk to me about any other religion. Don't talk to me about your great ribbies. Don't talk to me about Crown Heights. Talk to me about the book, the book called the Bible, the 66 books that have the prophecy, where the true prophecy of the people of Israel, salvation is of the Jews, where that, where that is uh, real, where that is found. Where you can have that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That, that's what we want to hear about. We want to hear about the true word of God. The true prophetic word of God. That's where we want to put our attention. And there was a true prophet in Israel. His name was Elisha. So uh, we get to this great announcement. You know, Naaman arrives at Elisha's house. Uh, da, 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 da. The, the, the bugle sounds. The trumpets uh, play their, their little chorus. Uh, we're supposed to all uh, take heed now. Uh, it's going to be just like Naaman wants it to be. The guy will come out. There'll be a lot of show, a lot of drama. A lot of fanfare. Uh, he will lay hands upon him, on the uh, leper. The leper will be instantly healed, and uh, it's going to be just like the worldly man wants it to be. And you know, you can have worldly religion just like you want it, with all the smells and bells. Yes, you can decide to go that direction if you want to. But this particular man did not get his smells and bells. He was very disappointed because he arrives at Elisha's house. <laughs> Elisha just uh, sends him a little message. <laughs> it's like a little uh, text on the uh, iPhone. Uh, basically, you know, okay, you're here. Big deal. Go down to the Jordan and uh, dip yourself seven times, okay? And I'm busy. And he His ego, his pride was very much uh, offended. What? Here I am, this big deal guy in the military. Uh, the king himself has sent me and, 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 you know, I can't even get an audience with you? What's going on here? And so he gets angry. Whenever God doesn't play ball the way we want him to. Whenever religion doesn't fit what we want as the director, producer, and chief writer of what the religion is supposed to be like and do like, we get offended and angry. And when I was a little boy, there was this one kid. He had a baseball bat. He had a softball. He had a couple of mitts. And whenever we were going to have a ball game, all the kids would run and get him, and we would start playing. But if anything in the ball game displeased him, he would just simply take his bat, his softball, and his two mitts and say, I'm out of here. Goodbye. And that was the end of the ball game. And, you know, in our pride, we like to do things like that. We like to just sit it out. And uh, Naaman says, look, I'm going to sit it out. If this is the way this guy is going to act, if I don't get any fanfare or any attention, if it's not going to be the way I want it to be, I'm going home. I'm out of here. Because he expects Elisha to come out and deal with him the way he thinks he's supposed to deal, be dealt with. But I have a big surprise for you, friend. It's not about what you think. It's about what God wants. And that's why we have to humble ourselves and meekly 
with the humility of a little child, a teachable little child who just sits at the little chair and says, okay, teacher, I will listen. You will tell me what to do. I will not tell you what to do. I'm just a little child. Unless you're like that, you will not enter the kingdom of God. We are warned about that. And here we're seeing people that don't enter the kingdom of God. Elisha, uh, uh, Elisha is in the kingdom of God. Gehazi is not in the kingdom of God. And Naaman is a, a kind of a multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And he's furious and uh, he's ready to go home. He's ready to take his bat and his uh, ball and his two gloves, uh, his two mitts and go home. But his officers convince him to obey and they give him this advice. Look, if he had asked you to do something complicated, wouldn't you have done it? Yeah. Well, if he's asking you to do something simple like this, why don't you just do that? And so he does. He humbles himself. He goes down to the to the Jordan. And here I want you to see this verse. It's right here on the screen. Then went he down and did undergo to be law. To be law. He dipped himself. He immersed himself. We're talking about the mikvah. We're talking about the, the Yarden River. We're talking about the gathering of the waters where in the Yarden, the whole nation of Israel humbled themselves like Naaman and went down to Yohanan the Mikvahist and they underwent a tevila, a they dipped themselves, they immersed themselves uh, uh, as they were instructed by the man of God, Yohanan, Yohanan of the mikvah. That's the way he is depicted in the Yiddish Brit Hadashah, Yohanan of the mikvah. And the whole nation went down and did this. And this was to prepare the people for the coming of Moshiach ben Dovid, Adonainu, oh hallelujah. The forerunner got all of Israel by the Holy Spirit's help to humble themselves like a leper and go down and dip and get ready to meet the Lord who was on his way. And here it says he went down, he did undergo Tevilah seven times in the Yarden, according to the Devar of the Ish Elohim. His basar came back like unto the basar of a na'ar, a na'ar katan, a little child. He was tahor, he was clean. So here you have the contrast there's a man who is clean, who had been cursed. And there is a man who is tahor, clean, but then he becomes cursed. And it's like you're asked by the Holy Spirit as you're reading this, okay, reader, what's it going to be with you? Are you going to be a Gehazi? Or are you going to be a Naaman? Are you going to do what Naaman did? Or are you going to do what Gehazi did? Are you going to pursue a prosperity gospel and not preach deliverance from the curse, deliverance uh, on the tree of the curse? Cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. Cursed is everyone who does not uphold all the, the words of this Torah to do it. And he took our curse for us, and 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 the curse was taken away, and we became like a Naar Katan, we became Tahor, we became clean. Hallelujah. This is the question of all questions. Will you be 
washed in the Jordan, will you be healed of this leprosy? Will you obey the word of God? And it's my prayer that we will see more and more people doing this now that we have the warm water at Beth Shalom, now that we have a mikvah that is warm, now that we're ready to do this, we're asking God then to bring a revival. And notice, Naaman attempts to give gifts to uh, Elisha. And it's like he's saying, well, come on, you know, you're famous. Everybody knows you, even in my country. You're a great man of God. You're a famous man of God. You should also be a rich man of God. So let's bring the money in. I understand it is filthy lucre. And I understand it could be a great uh, distraction. And that people can start looking at the money instead of the Lord. But look, I brought all this money here. You're not going to make me take it back, are you? Are you going to make me take this money back? to my, my country, I, I, I carried it all the way here, and here it is. And you would have thought that Elisha would have been somewhat tempted here to, uh, well, why not? Why, why not in, indulge with uh, the filthy lucre? But you see, he did not want to clutter or confuse the good news, the gospel, the Basuras Hageolah. He wanted to make it clear that salvation is of the Jews, that salvation involves being Tahor, having your sins washed away, having the curse, the curse that comes from Gan Eden, uh, where that expulsion took place, and where the curse chased the people for all those generations. They could not outrun the mavet, the death of that curse. Uh, it's appointed unto men once to die. And everybody has to die. Because death came. The wages of sin is death. And that death has come, and ever since Gan Eden, that death and that curse is coming. And we have to be tahor, we have to be clean. We have to be washed free of that curse. And that's what it's all about, my friend. It's not about prosperity, it's about that. And the real prosperity is to be Tahor and cleanse from the curse. And that's what uh, is not going to get contaminated with filthy lucre. Not if Elisha has anything to do with it. Elijah has anything to do with it. Elisha has anything to do with it. Because Elisha is the servant of Elijah, Eliyahu Hanavi. And Gehazi is the servant of Elisha. And Naaman vows that he will worship the Lord. And now he's going back to his country to worship the Lord. And everything is going well. But you know what? The ministry can degenerate from Elijah to Elisha to Gehazi. It can degenerate. And what started out as a gospel of signs and wonders and salvation and being tahor from the uh, curse can degenerate into a uh, well, you know, you could be as rich as me. Uh, all you've got to do is uh, see this Bible as a money-making deal. And uh, you'll find that God wants you rich. And this is the main concern. So we're going to... We're going to dress like money. We're going to act like money. We're going to worship like money. We're going to talk money. And uh, this is going to be our Gehazi 
approach. Well, look what happens here, friend. This 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 should scare you. It certainly scares me. Because here we see the curse of Gehazi. Second Kings chapter five, verse twenty. And notice it's all about his lust. People have a lust problem. Lust raised its ugly head in the garden. And the woman and the man succumbed to that lust. And it brought death. Elisha's servant Gehazi determines, he, he, he makes up his mind, he's going to get the money. He's going to sneak around. Uh, Elisha, you know, I got to go see a man about a dog. I'll be gone for a few minutes, maybe even a few hours. But you can get your water and the various things that you depend me depend on me for, because I'll just be gone for a, a, a short time. I have just a little errand to do. Well, that errand, my friend, is a big detour for the gospel. The gospel uh, is a precious thing. It is a mystery. It, it is not some kind of slogan that you can just memorize and throw all over the billboards. It is a mystery. And Gehazi is right now losing the gospel. He's losing the point of everything. He is following the money. Follow the money. Well, he's following the money, literally. So that's what he does. And even though Elisha refused the money, he knows better. You know, many people think they know better than their pastor. And they're not impressed. They do their own thing. And the sanctuary of the Lord. You know, Psalm 73, it's all about the sanctuary of the Lord. The, the psalmist, he doesn't really come to his senses until... He goes into the sanctuary of the Lord. And he sees that there are no Gehazis there. And that outside that sanctuary, there is a slippery place where your feet will slip. It's called the world. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And this guy with his lusts, is leaving the sanctuary, so to speak, and he's going into the world, and his feet are starting to slip, even as he hurries to catch up with Naaman and his chariot. And then it says in chapter 5, verse 21 of Second Kings, that Gehazi begins to lie. First there's lust, then there's insubordination and pride, I know that Elisha doesn't uh, Elisha doesn't want to accept it, but what does he know? I'm I'm going to accept it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get the money. Oh yes, I got to have the money. So Gahani tells Naaman that Elisha has changed his mind, but you know what? Elisha hasn't changed his mind. And I don't want to change my mind. No matter what happens, I want to be the same person that had 23 cents in the Wishing Well Motel. Because that person was not in it for the money. I want to be like I was, and I don't want to be corrupted. And I don't want a corrupt gospel. I want the real gospel. The one that saves, the one that saved Naaman, and the one that cursed Gehazi. You see, there's hell to gain, or I should say to shun, and heaven to gain. And here you see Gehazi, a uh, kind of a type of a hellion, somebody who's cursed, who's going 
to the flames. And then here you see Naaman, a man who was cursed, uh, who was a leper, who was unclean, but now is Tahor. And he's on his way to heaven where there will be no unclean person. Lord, I want to pray right now. If there's anything in my life that is unclean, I ask you right now, Lord, take it away from me. Take it away. Oh, dear God, don't let me be unclean. The blood of the Lamb will cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I want to cry out to you, Lord, that the blood of the Lamb will, 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 will take this leprosy that you took. It says in Isaiah 53 that Moshiach was like a leper. That, that he, he, he experienced a terrible Naaman thing to cleanse us and to make us clean, to make us tahor. And Elisha was there when Gehazi did this. There's no place I can go to escape you, Lord. If I go up as high as heaven, you're there. If I go as low as Sheol, you're there. I can't get away from your spirit. Help me not be duplicitous. Help me not pull, pull down the shade and try to do things that I know you don't like, as if you can't see them. Where are you, Adam? Where are you? Don't, don't lower the blinds. I can see you no matter where you are. If you go to Las Vegas, I'm there. If you go to an adult bookstore, I'm there. If you go to a legal marijuana shop, and buy your pot, I'm there. And God shows Gehazi he cannot escape. And he is cursed. And there is a terrible thing. There is an exchange. A man that seemed to be Tahor is actually cursed. And a man that seemed to be cursed is actually Tahor. And we know that there's no such thing as baptismal regeneration. But we do know that if we go and dip, that there is a blessing, because that's what God has told us to do. And he will use it as a point of contact it's a test also. Will we obey God? Gehazi was tested and he failed the test. Naaman was tested and he passed the test. And I pray, Lord, that that mikvah at Beth Shalom will be the very place where people prove that they are not Gehazis. They are Naamans. Lord, I want to pray right now that you protect and watch over Beth Shalom, watch over its mikvah, watch over everything that is there and everyone who comes in and goes out and everyone that is working to get the gospel preached. And I pray, dear God, that you will put your hand upon this message and that you will wake up a bunch of Gehazi preachers and that they will start preaching to the Jews and the Muslims and the unreached peoples of the earth. And, oh, God, I ask you, Mashiach ben Dovid, make me tahor in the blood of the Lamb and cleanse me from all unrighteousness in the name of Ha'av Haben and Haruach HaKodesh. And help me, Lord, to lead many people to you and to the Naaman Tevila Mikvah, where obedience finds Imunah and has a result called spiritual Tahor, 
and we'll give you the praise. And everyone said,